December 7th, 1941. The turmoil of World War II enters its 27th month. Japanese troops storm Shanghai. German armies stand at the gates of Moscow, leaving six and a half million casualties in their wake. Nazi Germany has mainland Europe in its grip. Under siege, Britain hangs on by a thread. 3,000 miles away, the United States remains at peace. 76% of her citizens support neutrality. At 7.55 a.m., the peace is shattered. 360 Japanese warplanes descend on Pearl Harbor. World War II has come to America. This is America's war as never seen before. From the unique vantage point of space. Witness the key battles unfold and the military strategies behind them in stunning detail. Revealed are the political alliances, the global battle for resources, and the astounding awakening of American military and manufacturing might that will determine the outcome of the greatest conflict ever fought. The unprovoked Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor will send shockwaves across the globe, but America has feared a strike for months. Since 1931, Japan's imperial ambitions have grown bolder and bolder. First, Manchuria is invaded, then China itself. When France falls to Nazi Germany in 1940, Japan seizes control of French into China. The U.S. response is rapid. Japan's financial assets are frozen and an oil embargo is imposed. The message is clear. Withdraw from Indochina or be economically crushed. After the embargo, Japan was faced with two choices. Stop territorial expansion, giving to the demands of the Allies, or go to war. Japan chooses war. In the words of Prime Minister Tojo, it is either glory or decline. It is imperative that they make the first decisive strike. The Japanese knew they were never going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the United States in a long naval war in the Pacific. They knew they didn't have the economic might, the military might, but it was a calculation that they could administer a knockout blow to the capital ships of the U.S. Pacific Fleet. If you could destroy the Pacific Fleet, the ability of the Americans to respond to anything for many months would be taken away. So the strike at Pearl Harbor was not just a strike at a symbol of American power, it was American power in the Pacific. What American intelligence cannot see is revealed from space. Admiral Yamamoto's fleet departs Japan on the longest assault in history. Avoiding shipping lanes and landmass, they arrive unseen 275 miles from their target. It's the perfect vantage point, beyond the range of America's defensive radar, but at the optimum strike distance for its force of 414 cutting-edge aircraft. The jewel in the crown, the Mitsubishi Zero. It's faster than anything that they've used before. It's incredibly maneuverable and it has extreme range. But while the technology was pretty good, what mattered at Pearl Harbor was the man behind it. It was the pilot. The Japanese pilots have already been at war for years. So they're well-trained crews. You add on top of that, they've been planning that attack for a long period of time, so they've been running war games, simulating it, going through the action again and again, so that basically many of them talk about how they could have done it going in blind. At 7.55 a.m., the first wave of bombers swoop from the sky. On the deck of the USS Arizona is Don Stratton. We knew, by the way, that they were Japanese planes. And uh, 
we knew that they were bombing Fort Island and something was radically wrong. Planes were strafing and dive bombing. It was just a horrible experience and a horrible sight. It was a high altitude bomber, dropped like a 2,000 pound bomb. I mean, it just devastated everything in its path. And the concussion and the smoke and the fire was horrendous. It just was like you'd lost your home. Of eight battleships at anchor, the Arizona, Oklahoma, West Virginia, and California are sunk. The rest severely damaged. In 68 minutes, Japan has crippled the heart of America's Pacific Fleet. From a Japanese perspective, the attack on Pearl Harbor succeeded beyond the most optimistic expectations. When you consider the losses that the Japanese suffered in this attack, it was essentially nothing. The Japanese lose 64 men to 3,649 U.S. casualties. A human damage ratio of 57 to 1. But Japan's margin of victory hides two major flaws in the attack. The Japanese failed to systematically attack the oil fields, the oil storage tanks at Pearl Harbor. If they'd have spent one more sortie taking out those oil tanks, they would have crippled the whole Pacific fleet, which wouldn't have had the fuel supplies to keep going. More significant are the ships the Japanese failed to target. The American aircraft carriers were absent from Pearl Harbor at the time of the Japanese attack. And as things evolved very quickly, it became clear that the aircraft carrier was destined to become the most significant naval asset for either side in the Pacific War, and the American carriers were uh, untouched. Oil supplies and air domination. Two factors that will dictate the fate of World War II and Japan fails to damage either. Instead, it has awoken the full wrath of the sleeping American giant. Pearl Harbor infuriated the American people and also infuriated the American military. Massive casualties, destruction of most of the Pacific Fleet. If you wanted to do one thing to unite a country that before this had been rather divided about what to do about the war, Pearl Harbor was it. This was like a lightning rod throughout the American population. No longer was President Roosevelt limited in his options. He had a United States population that was angry and unified and desired revenge against Japan. Her era of isolationism is over. America is at war and begins its rise to become the most powerful nation on the planet. Washington calculates victory will cost $300 billion, $4.4 trillion in today's money, over one and a half times the total U.S. federal budget. The government can raise half through increased taxes. For the rest, it must turn to the public. To raise $300 billion was then viewed as an insurmountable challenge because basically we had to get half the population in the United States to buy bonds. And what we were saying is we're in World War II, we're in this to win, it's a fight of good versus evil, and you, on an individual level, are going to make a difference. To guarantee success, the ad men of New York recruit America's most potent propaganda asset. We had the Hollywood machine. America had mass-marketed movies, they knew the power of Hollywood, they knew the power of celebrities. Over 300 movie icons joined the Stars Over America campaign, crisscrossing the nation. Chicago, two huge celebrity rallies sell over $15 million in bonds. New York, a three-way baseball game generates $56 million. By the end of the war, bonds campaigns raise $187.5 billion. To get everybody aligned behind one goal and make the transaction is, is huge. America and its beleaguered allies are going to need every cent. 
Four days after Pearl Harbor, Nazi Germany declares war on the United States. She now faces two vast and battle-hardened powers on two fronts. When America entered the war, it looked as if the military aggressors were going to win. Seen from space, America's peril is clear. Her fleet is in disarray, and her Pacific assets at the mercy of a rampant Japan. On the other side of the planet, her strongest military ally, Great Britain, is buckling under siege from Nazi Germany. America is at the epicenter of the greatest conflict in history. Roosevelt must make the biggest call of any U.S. presidency. Which enemy to engage first? Franklin Delano Roosevelt decided that Germany was the one that could take down our closest friends around the world, and they had to make sure that Britain survived. Keeping Britain afloat was essential to the long-term prospects of victory. It stood as a large aircraft carrier that would enable an invasion onto the continent. If Britain fell under Nazi domination, the challenge would be almost insurmountable. For Roosevelt, the future of Great Britain is the future of the war. But after 17 months of fighting alone, its survival rests on a knife edge. Isolated, Britain's only hope is to keep her supply routes open. A fragile lifeline German Admiral Dönitz seeks to destroy. Britain depended on the import of 5 million tons of stuff every month. German Admiral Dönitz argued very persuasively, if we can subtract a million tons a month, we will bring Britain to its knees. Dönitz's lethal weapon is the U-boat. Capable of traveling thousands of miles submerged and armed with a deadly cocktail of deck guns, mines, and torpedoes, it is the perfect weapon to starve Britain into submission. When they attack, they're sending over 9,000 tons of supplies to the bottom of the ocean. With one munition, one torpedo, when it detonates, it creates this void underneath the vessel that creates the vessel to collapse. It's the difference between being stabbed and someone breaking your back. It's a killer. Churchill introduces naval convoys to protect the merchant fleets. Dönitz's response is devastating. Admiral Dönitz introduced this thing called Rudel tactic, wolf pack tactic. A Rudel is a pack of animals. And instead of approaching singly, as submarines have done in the past, the Germans would have their U-boats strung out in these long patrol lines. And then they would use radio signals to congregate in a pack and overwhelm the defenses of the convoy. The results are devastating. When you get caught by a pack of these, you might lose half or more of the convoy. In 12 months, 900 ships are sunk. Only 29 U-boats are destroyed. It's a war of attrition Britain is losing fast. Winston Churchill knows one big thing in 1940, that for Britain to be able to fight this war, it needs American help. It can't do it alone. Churchill tirelessly lobbies Roosevelt for American support. Though officially neutral, Roosevelt cuts a deal. The U.S. gives 50 destroyers to Britain to keep it in the fight, but at a price. In return, Britain hands over eight of its overseas bases to America and dismantles its preferential trading system with its colonies. It was a very mixed deal for Britain because on the one hand it helps Britain fight the war. They couldn't have done it without American support materially. On the other hand, it accelerates the collapse of the British Empire, it makes the empire more and more unaffordable. Winston Churchill, that's a very painful deal, but one that probably has to be made. December 1941, America enters the war. Its first act of aggression is to join Britain in the Battle of the Atlantic, a strategy that meets with disaster. When America enters the war, the Battle of the Atlantic actually takes a turn. Worse for the Allies. The amount of Allied shipping that sunk goes up by these astronomical amounts. By mid-1942, 2,703 Allied ships are sunk, a U-boat kill ratio of 36 to 1. 
it's an unsustainable rate of loss. Even with America fighting alongside, the liberty of Britain and the freedom of Europe hang by a thread. Mid-1942, Britain remains in the stranglehold of the German U-boat menace. American ships coming to its aid are being destroyed at alarming rates. To reverse their fortunes, the Allies must gain the upper hand in the intelligence war. The most critical factor in the Battle of the Atlantic was the exchange of information between the Americans and the British. It, it maximized both the technological and intellectual capabilities of both sides. The precedent for this vital collaboration is the Tizard mission, 15 months before the Pearl Harbor attack. With Nazi invasion seemingly inevitable, Henry Tizard, head of the British Aeronautical Committee, persuades Churchill to gift America every scientific innovation Britain holds in exchange for access to U.S. production lines. The blueprints are packed into a single trunk. Embarking from Britain, it reaches Washington, D.C. in September 1940. That box was described by one American official as the most important cargo that ever reached its shores. The trunk contains the memorandum on the feasibility of the atomic bomb, designs for jet engines, rockets, superchargers, gyroscopic gun sights, submarine detection devices, self-sealing fuel tanks, plastic explosives, and perhaps the most important invention of World War II. A working magnetron number 12. An advancement in radar technology a thousand times more effective than the best American counterpart. This was revolutionary. You can put it into an aircraft, you can put it on a ship, then you can take that technology and take it anywhere on the battle space. American assembly lines begin mass producing the device that will change the course of the war. Its first challenge, to close the deadly mid-Atlantic gap. From space, the boneyard of Allied shipping is startlingly revealed. You can fly missions from the United States, you can fly missions from Britain, but you can't quite close everything. You've got the mid-Atlantic gap in the middle. The U-boats realize that and concentrate in that area. By April 1943, 3,450 Allied ships have been lost. But new carriers are launched, loaded with long-range aircraft fitted with the Magnetron No. 12, and the gap begins to close. It turns the Atlantic from this wide mass in which the U-boat can hide in to know I can find you out there. As British codebreakers crack the German Enigma code, the final piece of the Allied resurgence falls into place, and the tactical and technological advantage is exploited in the convoy battle known as ONS-5. Among all the convoy battles, one of the most important was ONS-5 in April 43, and it's important really because it, it demonstrated clearly, I think, how far the Allies had gone. 42 ships of the slow-bound ONS-5 convoy leave Liverpool for Canada. For Dernitz, it is a perfect target. Dernitz is feeling this great sense of urgency, like he needs to sink more and more tons of shipping, and he actually presses his luck in this battle. The first wave of U-boats sink 13 Allied ships. But as thick fog falls, the advantage switches. Armed with the German codes and advanced radar, the Allies strike back with impunity. Zernis fights longer than he should, brings in more U-boats than he should, which are then, in fact, chewed up by the convoy. After the battle, Zernis says the battle of is over. Because he sees how expert the British and Americans have become at detecting U-boats, chasing them down, and killing them. With ONS-5, the Battle of the Atlantic is all but won. And the astonishing transformation of American industry can start to dictate the fortunes of war. With the money and the might to outproduce the Axis, America embarks on an unprecedented industrial and social revolution.
you had a war industrial board and they looked around the United States and said this particular place is going to be where we're going to build tanks, we're going to build planes here, and so the population went there. It's as if in World War II somebody had picked up the North American continent at the eastern seaboard and raised it and tipped it and everything, people, money, machines, everything just slid westward across the continent. The population of California swells by 53%, Oregon by 40%, and Washington by 37%. 19 million women become the core of the American labor force, working in war factories, transportation, and agriculture across the nation. Manufacturers of all sizes become a critical part of the war effort. Typewriter manufacturers, canned goods manufacturers, they're all converted, they're all mobilized, if you will, to support the war effort. Car factories are turned into making bombers, and refrigerator factories are turned into making armored cars. Not for nothing, it's called the production miracle. American industry produces 87,000 ships and landing craft, 100,000 tanks and armored vehicles, 300,000 aircraft, 2 million trucks, 20 million rifles and small arms, and 41 billion rounds of ammunition, enough to kill the population of the world 17 times over. Yet America's decision to engage Germany first comes at a price. The Japanese centrifugal offensive was a shock to everybody. Uh, they seemed unstoppable. Japan advances through the Pacific unchecked, capturing American, British, and Dutch territories in a string of decisive victories. Within six months, they have near complete control of the Pacific theater. They capture territories for two main reasons. The first one is for resources. Dutch East Indies provide oil and rubber, which they're going to need to keep the war machine going. They also knew America would eventually respond. And so a lot of the territories were going to be barriers to set up against the Americans when they came back across. April 1942, America strikes back. Launching from the U.S. Hornet, 16 B-25s kickstart the next phase of war by bombing Tokyo. For the Americans, the raid is a chance to strike back, even though it didn't really do very much material damage. It had a major impact on Japanese leadership. The military was embarrassed they'd allowed their, the emperor to be threatened like that. The Japanese respond, setting their sights on America's most westerly Pacific base. From space, their strategy is clear. Seizing the island of Midway will extend their defensive perimeter deep into American waters. And their plan is, we're going to surprise the Americans, we're going to seize Midway, and then they're going to be forced to come out and fight us on our terms. The problem for the Japanese is, the Americans already know they're coming. The story of the American Code Breakers is one of these lesser known, but perhaps one of the most important parts of the story of why America wins in the Pacific. From June 1939, the U.S. Navy Combat Intelligence Unit, under the command of Joseph Rochefort, has been attempting to decipher JN-25, the Japanese naval code. Using punch card technology and mathematical analysis, they work around the clock. In the lead-up to Midway, the decisive breakthrough is made. They break the code. They knew the Japanese were coming. They knew where they were coming to Midway. They even knew when they were coming. U.S. intelligence finally grasps the full scale of the Japanese attack. The situation is highly precarious. With a weakened fleet and up against a battle-hardened enemy force, Midway is the moment of truth. The only way the Midway Battle would work for America was to have their carriers in the right place and be able to strike the Japanese at just the right time. The Americans have got to get in the first major shot. At 4 a.m., Japanese bombing of Midway begins. What Admiral Nagumo can't see is 275 miles away, safely outside the range of Japanese radar. Four U.S. carriers are poised for a counterattack. 
Only at 7.40 a.m. does a Japanese reconnaissance plane spot the U.S. fleet. Battles are often decided by minutes and seconds. And Midway is filled with important minutes and seconds. When the late spotter plane finally finds American fleet, Admiral Nagumo is hit with this dilemma about, do I outfit my aircraft for bombs to bomb Midway, as they already are, or do I stop, take those bombs off and put on torpedoes so they go after the American fleet? And whatever decision he comes upon is going to have a major impact on the rest of the battle. While they were doing all this, of course, there was a long, critical waiting point with aircraft on the decks, huge quantities of explosives around. For the Japanese, this was the riskiest moment. It is the moment America has been waiting for. 41 Douglas torpedo bombers descend for the attack. But the American torpedo bombers show up unescorted, completely vulnerable. They're shot down fish in a barrel. They just don't survive. 35 out of 41 planes are lost. Not a single bomb hits the Japanese fleet. It seems that Japan has struck the decisive blow. And then all of a sudden, the dive bombers come in and the whole world changes. A second wave of American dive bombers descends. There's the Japanese fleet with no air cover and the decks covered with airplanes and torpedoes and bombs. They're just torches to be lit. Then the dive bombers will come in and three Japanese aircraft carriers are destroyed in minutes. As the final Japanese carrier is destroyed, along with 250 elite Japanese pilots, the balance of power has dramatically swung in America's favor. We had seven new carriers under construction. They had one carrier under construction. So they were never going to be able to replace these carriers. And what it meant is they would be thrown back on the defensive for the duration of the war. In a global theater of war, control of the air is proving to be one of the determining factors for victory. On the other side of the planet, America's first strikes on Nazi Germany are coming from the sky. The major cities in Europe are the new front lines of war. Six months on from Pearl Harbor and the battlefronts of World War II are at a tipping point. America and her allies have stalled the momentum of German aggression in the Battle of the Atlantic and halted Japanese territorial expansion in the decisive victory at Midway. And in June 1942, the first American bombers arrive in Great Britain. They join a brutal battle for air supremacy that has raged over Europe since the outbreak of war. Germany's Luftwaffe squadrons draw first blood, bringing Poland, then the Low Countries and France to their knees. The fall of France in 1940 really seemed to vindicate the superiority of the Blitzkrieg. There's big concerns that the, the Germans may be unstoppable. With Nazi domination almost complete, Hitler turns the Luftwaffe against his last remaining opposition, Great Britain. It is imperative that its Royal Air Force holds. The stakes in the Battle of Britain for the British are survival. July 10th, 1940, the Battle of Britain begins. The Luftwaffe pounds British defenses and its major cities. The RAF adapts very quickly and begins to shoot down more German bombers and fighters than the Germans can replace. 1,900 German aircraft are destroyed in 113 days. It is an unsustainable rate of attrition. So Hitler's forced to cancel the Battle of Britain and begin massing forces for an invasion of the Soviet Union. The Battle of Britain is Hitler's first major defeat of World War II. Air power is the new orthodoxy of modern warfare. Roosevelt orders vast squadrons of aircraft to be manufactured. 
At Ford's Willow Run plant in Michigan, an astounding 8,500 bombers are produced. Over 127,000 bombers are made. 13,600 are transported to British airfield. The assault on Germany can now enter a new phase of intensity. The arrival of the 8th Air Force in Britain had a number of impacts. Number one, it guaranteed that the Germans weren't going to be able to launch another major attack against Britain the way they had in the Battle of Britain. There were just too many Allied airplanes there. It also was a boost to British morale that the Americans were finally coming in mass. But the American airmen are entering a new kind of warfare, where sheer weight of numbers is no guarantee of success. The amount of weapons that are being thrown up to stop the bombers is having an enormous toll. The survivability rate is going 11 to 1 to the infantry. It's actually safer to be an infantryman on the ground in Europe in a foxhole than it is to be in this uh, advanced machine flying high above. After losing 1,135 bombers, the RAF switches to nighttime raids. But in the dark, only 1.5% of all bombs fall within three miles of the target. The Americans just thought that as too inefficient. They had to do it in daylight where you could see the target. They thought, we've got more heavily defended bombers, we think this will work. American confidence is based on the B-17, the most sophisticated war machine of its time. The B-17 is an amazing aircraft. They call it the Flying Fortress. Well, why? It has 13 50 caliber machine guns arrayed all around it to give it a bubble of fire. You have fire coming out the front, you have fire coming out the flanks, below, above, and in the rear. It was believed that it could fly in broad daylight, unescorted by fighter aircraft, deep into the heart of enemy territory and unleash an amazing amount of ordnance on enemy targets. With unswerving faith in the B-17, the American 8th Air Force plan a dual raid to destroy the heart of German aviation production. The Schweinfurt Regensburg mission was seen as the way to really prove that this precision bombing idea would work. They seemed to have picked out the key industry that they could knock out that would cripple the German economy. They had the battle plan they thought that would get them to the target. Two squadrons of B-17s, commanded by Colonel LeMay and Brigadier General Williams, prepare to attack simultaneously, splitting German defenses. Almost immediately, the plan begins to unravel. It's a foggy day in England. LeMay got his guys up. The other bomber division couldn't get up. The decision was made that they couldn't land LeMay's guys. They sent them on. When the Regensburg mission goes in on its own, the bombers were sitting ducks, not only for flak, but for the Germans that were gathering from all over the whole defense zone. The Schweinfurt leg then comes in enough time after the Regensburg leg so the Germans can refit and rearm. And, and it goes through the same mauling. Sixty U.S. bombers are destroyed, double the losses ever suffered in a single raid. The problem for the Allies was we took the marketing of the Flying Fortress seriously. We took the idea that it could protect itself with its own machine guns and not have to worry about escorted seriously, and that didn't work. The flaw is startlingly clear from above. The lack of fighter escort protection. The fighters have limited range and can only protect the bombers part way to their targets, leaving them dangerously exposed. Then we get the real game changer. We get the P-51. The P-51 was an amazing fighter on so many different levels. But the real key is it had amazing range. It went with the American bombers all the way in, all the way out. That meant we could take down the German defenses. We could create true air dominance. And that's when you see the Luftwaffe essentially swept from the skies. Once the Luftwaffe is destroyed, and we have pretty much free reign over the German skies, we really start to take down the oil industry. Oil, the single most essential commodity of World War II. Possession of large supplies of oil was the only way to victory. Without oil, mechanized armies could not fight. 
from space, the battle for the world's oil reserves is revealed. America is self-sufficient. Its oil fields are the cornerstone of Allied military strength. In contrast, Germany's stockpile of 20 million barrels is rapidly running out. One of the weaknesses from the German warfare was they couldn't get access to unlimited quantities of oil. They then decided to use synthetic oil, and synthetic oil was really critical for making up that difference. Synthetic oil, produced from coal and natural gas, is the lifeblood of Hitler's mechanized forces. As Allied air raids cripple Germany's synthetic fuel production, Hitler's best hope is to seize the Caucasus' oil fields. Deep inside Russia, the two sides clash in the bloodiest fighting history has ever seen. At stake is the outcome of World War II. September 1940. While America remains neutral, Hitler has mainland Europe in his grip. But in the skies over Britain, the Nazis' relentless westward advance is halted. It is a defeat that forces Hitler to turn his attention towards the ultimate goal, the conquest and annihilation of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union represented the nexus of everything that Hitler hated. He saw it as a bastion of communism and Judaism. And if it were not defeated, ultimately the Soviet Union would destroy Germany and destroy the Aryan race. But there was also just sheer pragmatism here. The Soviet Union was the Großraumwirtschaft, the great economic space. They needed the raw materials, the oil, the food, and by annexing the Soviet Union, they'd be able to sustain a long war and fend off any British-American attacks. June 22, 1941. Hitler launches Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union. Across an 1,800-mile front, Hitler's army of over 4 million Wehrmacht troops surges forward, destroying everything in its path. This was the largest army that had been assembled in the history of the world. And the Germans demonstrated an operational and tactical mastery that the, the Soviets simply could not match. And the barbarity is almost incomprehensible. Following the frontline troops, there were special action squads. Their purpose was to identify and murder political leaders and ultimately Jews in the occupied areas. The slaughter of a million Soviets is the merciless testing ground for the Holocaust. The SS accelerate the genocide of Jews and others seen as undesirable. Over nine million are slaughtered. This was industrialized mass murder. This is something that, that hadn't even appeared in the Middle Ages. By the winter of 1941, their brutal advance has brought them to the brink of victory. Leningrad is under siege, and German panzer divisions are at the gates of Moscow. Seeking a devastating tactical and ideological blow, Hitler turns his attentions towards Stalingrad. Stalingrad was an important target for Hitler because he knew by taking it, he would insult Stalin. He also knew he would force Stalin to try to take it back and he would be able to wear down the Red Army. But also it was an important city because it would permit him to pivot south into the Caucasus and take all these oil-producing regions and make Germany self-sufficient in petroleum. For both sides, the stakes for the Battle of Stalingrad are immense. For Hitler, to fail at Stalingrad would be an enormous blow to the Nazi myth. It would be an enormous blow to the war itself. Similarly, Joseph Stalin was unrelenting. He would not tolerate defeat. He would not tolerate pulling back. To surrender or to give ground would be met by the, the utmost sanction. The Luftwaffe drop a thousand tons of bombs on Stalingrad before two and a half million troops clash. 
the ferocity of the Battle of Stalingrad was something straight out of hell. It was not uncommon for battles to be raging, not over parts of the city or city blocks, but literally for different floors within one building. In some cases, Soviet reinforcements came forward without weapons, facing certain death. And yet, again and again and again, they came. As the battle rages, the Red Army launches Operation Uranus. What Hitler's high command cannot see is revealed from space. Over one million Soviet soldiers outflank the German positions before cutting through the enemy's rear. Operation Uranus was a complete shock, and suddenly Stalingrad was encircled. Cut off from supply, the Germans are plunged into the harshest of Russian winters. In subhuman conditions, they begin to disintegrate. It was freezing cold. Food supplies began to decline, guns jammed. It was a nightmare. It's difficult to convey in simple words what that experience was like. After five months under siege, Hitler's once mighty 6th Army capitulated. The first German field army to do so. Nearly two million have fallen. But for the Soviets, the tide is turning. The boost to Soviet morale can scarcely be overstated. German prisoners were marched through Moscow, and this proved that the Nazi soldiers were not supermen. Instead, they saw German soldiers who quit, who surrendered, who could not match the determination of the Soviet soldier. For Hitler, the defeat is devastating. Instinctively, he strikes back. Adolf Hitler attempted to regain the strategic initiative to close a, a gap, a bulge, if you will, centered around Kursk. Seen from above, Hitler's objective is clear. Eliminate the bulge, concentrate his forces, and regain the initiative. For the Allies, it is critical that its newest military partner holds. The Eastern Front is vital to the Allies because it absorbs the bulk of Germany's fighting power. To put it very brutally, the Soviets do most of the fighting and most of the dying on land. President Roosevelt commits over $11 billion of Lend-Lease supplies to Stalin. Yet traditional trade routes through Europe are blocked. Getting U.S. aid into the Soviet Union is one of the greatest Allied logistical challenges of the war. There were three routes that we could use. One was the North Atlantic route into the northern Arctic ports of Archangel and Murmansk. Stormy seas, iced in, hard to get to. And then there was one across the Pacific to Vladivostok. But everything had to be unloaded in Siberia and then trucked into Russia on the Trans-Siberian Railway, which is slow and time-consuming. And then there was the one around the Cape of Good Hope, up into uh, Iran and into southern Russia that way. The Persian Gulf route is crucial to Russian success, but making it viable is a monumental task. We had to build a supply chain from scratch. There is no infrastructure. The harbors are not there. We have to construct those. Allied engineers build wharfs, jetties, and piers. Simultaneously, 450 miles of roads are constructed and 2,000 miles of railway modernized. With all routes now open, the U.S. pumps 16 million tons of Lend-Lease into Russia, including our gasoline, ammunition, an entire military telecommunication system, 14 million pairs of boots, and enough food to offer every Soviet soldier one square meal a day for over a year. But most significant are the half a million Studebaker trucks supplied by the factories of Detroit. The Studebaker truck was a real game changer because it gives the Soviet army the ability to operate on a massive scale with far-flung logistics. The other thing that these trucks give them is an advantage literally within the battle itself. The Russians had a lot of artillery. You match that artillery with the truck and suddenly they've got these flying anti-tank batteries literally zipping across different parts of the battlefield. To give the Soviets the tactical advantage at Kursk, the Allies supply one final thing. Intelligence of the German offensive plans. 
the Soviets knew they were coming. And so they create defenses of a scale that really hadn't been seen before in the war. I mean, people talk about the Maginot Line in France. This thing was the Maginot Line put on steroids. From space, the full enormity of the Soviet defenses becomes clear. Three defensive lines contain a vast interconnected web of thousands of anti-tank guns, pre-sighted artillery zones, and over 400,000 mines. It is the largest defense network ever constructed, over 50 miles deep. July 5th, 1943. Over 2,000 tanks and 2 million troops engage. The level of intensity at the Battle of Kursk was extraordinary. Large numbers of tanks and soldiers were fighting the most brutal degree at very close quarters. There was brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat, flamethrowers, thousands of tanks coupled with artillery raining down. All of this would have combined to create a scene that would have resembled hell on earth. After 11 days, the German offensive collapses only a third of the way to their objective. Hitler's attempt to crush the Soviet Union has failed. Hitler's worst nightmare had come to pass. Germany would now be faced with a war on two fronts and a war of attrition. Stalin gains the initiative on the Eastern Front at a huge cost over nine million Soviet casualties. In contrast, America has yet to put a single soldier on the battlefields of Europe. Stalin was deeply frustrated with Allied dawdling about opening a second front. He assumed that it was a conspiracy, that Churchill and Roosevelt were going to fight to the last Russian. Then the British and Americans would cross the channel and harvest all the spoils of war, the Russians having won it with their own blood and treasure. Prior to a full-scale invasion of Europe, Roosevelt elects to blood his troops in North Africa. The North African campaign was a testing ground for the American army, which had yet to face the German military in a significant way. Overconfident and inexperienced, the U.S. military is about to receive a baptism of fire that will shake it to its core. The disaster at Kasserine Pass was a seminal event. As the American Pacific drive towards Japan accelerates, and as Stalin in the East and the Allied bombing campaign in the West continue to weaken the Third Reich, America prepares to test its troops in North Africa. They will join a desert campaign that has been raging for over two years. June 10th, 1940. Italy, under Benito Mussolini, joins the Axis. And with Germany, plans to force Britain from North Africa. North Africa was a vital front for the British in World War II because it was the vital hinge of the British Empire. A German and Italian victory will open up the untapped oil reserves of the Middle East and seize the Suez Canal that connects Britain to its empire. The Suez Canal you need to protect at all costs. The bottom line, if you're moving large quantities of equipment, you got to use the sea lanes, and that's as true today as it was then. September 1940, the Axis invades. For two years, they drive the British back. But the advance is halted as German Field Marshal Rummel is defeated at El Alamein. To capitalize on this victory, Churchill lobbies Roosevelt for support. But the majority of presidential advisors have their doubts. Initially, most American senior military personnel saw the campaign in North Africa as a diversion from the main effort, essentially a waste of time. Decisively, Roosevelt overrides his counsel. FDR's decision to send American forces to North Africa, probably the most important strategic decision of World War II. 
it really gave us a place where we could land the U.S. Army, bring it into battle against secondary German units, not the units we'd encounter in Europe. And so it was a, it was a, it was a brilliant move. Since the Pearl Harbor attack, a vast American army has been amassing, hungry for their first taste of war. People were lined up at the recruiting stations. All the boys were up in arms. I graduated in February, and I was in uniform in March. The country had been violated, is what we thought, and everybody just wanted to get busy and do something about it. Volunteers and inductees from the draft swell the ranks as America rises to become the largest military power in the world. Before the war, the total strength of the U.S. Army, including its Air Corps, was well below 200,000. There would be over a 40-fold increase in the space in six years. During the war, the armed forces encompassed 16 million men under arms. That's 13% of the entire population. With this vast army assembled, America is primed for Operation Torch. Then, the largest amphibious invasion in history. Torch actually was a very important rehearsal for D-Day. It was a huge uh, operation. Uh, it was logistically extremely complex. Torch was a monumental challenge for the U.S. because we hadn't won the Battle of the Atlantic yet. We have to escort troops, ammunition, supplies from the United States direct to North Africa, escort troops from Great Britain down to North Africa through waters patrolled by German submarines. Then we have to land them on a hostile shore. November 8, 1942. 73,000 Allied troops disgorge onto the beaches. And immediately, the problems begin. What we saw in the landings in North Africa is a great study of everything that could go wrong in an amphibious landing, and virtually everything that could go wrong did go wrong. The landing craft, you didn't run out the front, right onto the beach. Instead, you had to jump over the side. That, of course, is not the most efficient way to get in there. It's the most dangerous. It's the slowest. A number of our craft get stuck on sandbars. When they drive them out, the electronics get fried. Fortunately, they're fighting the Vichy French, who fight half-heartedly. And had they been attacking the Germans in, in 1944, the Japanese in 1944, the experience would have been a, 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 lot, uh, a lot worse. As French Vichy troops loyal to Hitler capitulate, U.S. forces head for Tunisia and their first clash with the full-strength German war machine. They're really blissfully ignorant of the realities of modern war. I mean, they've got their trucks, they've got their tanks, they've got their rifles, they've got their very complicated chain of command from army to corps, division, brigade, regiment, battalion. They think that they'll do fine. U.S. forces engage Rommel outside the town of Faid. Making an initial breakthrough, they pursue retreating panzer divisions. From space, Rommel's master tactic is revealed. The panzers are decoys, luring U.S. forces into a trap. They fall prey to the techniques of double envelopment by the Germans with some very good weapons like the German 88. The 88 millimeter gun was literally a world-class anti-tank weapon. Not only could it shoot at a further distance, but it had an incredible kill rate. It's basically just lethal. This thing is, is diabolic. In many cases, Americans either surrendered or dropped their weapons and ran. The American performance, uh, to put it charitably, was, was abysmal. U.S. forces are pushed back into Kesserine Pass, where under constant attack, the untested units fall apart. To raise our force of 16 million people in a hurry means that in the initial stages of armed conflict, you're going to have troops in the front line who have no taste of battle before this moment. <laughs> Dwight Eisenhower, for example, becomes the Supreme Allied Commander. Before World War II, before his North African campaign, he had never heard a bullet fired in anger in his entire life. Uh, he had no, no actual combat experience. Further disaster is averted when reinforcements from the British First Army arrive. And with Field Marshal Montgomery approaching from the east, Rommel retreats. Frank Gervaisi witnesses the aftermath. 
when we got to Catherine Pass and we had patrols going out, and you still smell the flesh from, you know, the burnout tanks and human beings and all. It was bad. We took an awful beating. Don't forget that we were against Germany's best, Rommel's. We had the equipment, but we didn't have the experience. America suffers 6,500 casualties. Its first land battle in World War II is a disaster. Kazarine was a tremendous defeat for the United States. There's just no way to sugarcoat that. On the other hand, Kazarine is the best thing that ever happened to the U.S. Army. It's better to get your butt kicked there than to get your butt kicked in Normandy. There are some changes made in policies and how we're going to operate, but there are also some key leadership changes. You've got Eisenhower earning his spurs, you've got George Patton. And the lessons learned in North Africa are going to be applied for the rest of World War II. The new U.S. Army doctrines ensure a dramatic turnaround. First, Tunisia falls, followed by Sicily, preparing the way for the Allied invasion of Italy. And on the other side of the world, the Pacific War enters a new phase of ferocity. The carnage was, was phenomenal. From the ashes of Pearl Harbor, the American war machine is approaching full potential, engaging her enemies on three continents. In the Pacific, troop numbers grow by 457%. Its fleet trebles in size. With this vast force assembled, America's final drive towards Japan begins. The American strategy is a dual-pronged approach with Admiral Nimitz, with the Navy Marines going through the Central Pacific, General MacArthur, with most of the Army forces coming through the Southwest Pacific, both approaching Japan from different axes. Admiral Nimitz's flotilla is the largest in history the perfect weapon to destroy Japan's defensive strongholds. It's this massive fleet of aircraft carriers, destroyers, fast battleships, backed by this long logistics train of supply ships, boilers, hospital ships, you name it. This thing was lethality and industrialization personified. The flotilla targets Saipan, one of the Mariana Islands. Its airfields can become the launch pad for a sustained aerial bombardment of Japan. Emperor Hirohito demands his 32,000 troops stationed there to defend at all costs. For the Japanese, defeat was not an option, retreat was not an option. If it meant losing everything and everyone, they would do it in pursuit of victory. June 1944, 8,000 U.S. Marines hit the beaches under intense Japanese fire. For the Marines, it was a nightmare. At the end of the day, Japanese have one job, which is to inflict heavy casualties on the people attacking them. Uh, if you're on the front line, you're going to be one of those casualties. Facing fanatical resistance, a further 80,000 troops land, all dependent on naval support. But what U.S. Commander Admiral Spruance cannot see are 55 Japanese ships rapidly approaching. For the Japanese, this really was going to be their last shot. They had to have success here in this particular battle. They were not going to be able to ever field this kind of force again. Responding to danger, Spruance splits his force, dispatching one half to engage the Japanese fleet. As the two forces clash, U.S. technological superiority dominates, most notably 480 newly developed Hellcats. The Hellcat's just an incredible weapon. It's fast. It can take hits and still keep going on. It's well armored. And on top of that, it's now flown by elite pilots. The Japanese lost most of their well-trained pilots in other battles. They couldn't replace them. They didn't have the fuel to train. Their aircraft weren't as good. And that's what really creates the turkey shoot of the Battle of the Philippine Sea. 
Over the next eight hours, 429 Japanese planes are destroyed compared to 29 American, a kill ratio of 15 to 1. The scale of the slaughter between American pilots and Japanese is significant enough for after the Battle of Marianas, the Japanese aircraft carrier force is no longer a factor in the war in the Pacific. On land, American troops continue to face ferocious resistance. The Pacific War was a bitter and cruel war, but in Saipan, it became more and more evident how deep was the Japanese ferocity or the ferociousness of the Japanese capacity to resist. And there are these hair-raising stories about how the Americans had to lower drums of gasoline and explode them in the caves in which the Japanese were hiding because they could not induce people to come out and surrender. The suicidal fervor is not confined to soldiers. 8,000 Japanese civilians leap to their deaths. The American witnesses could not believe their eyes that they were seeing this mass suicide of Japanese civilians, including women and children, women mothers killing their own babies, uh, rather than surrender to the Americans. When Saipan falls, over 3,400 Americans lie dead alongside 46,000 Japanese, half of whom are civilian suicides. It's a mere taste of what's to come. January 1945, American Air Force General Curtis LeMay arrives at the Concord airfields of the Marianas. The war in the Pacific is about to ruthlessly escalate. Curtis LeMay believed there should be no hesitation and no moderation in bringing destruction to the enemy. And the surest, most effective way to do that would be through massive, unrestrained strategic bombing. He was going out to destroy the industrial power of Japan. And the kindling for all those fires he was lighting to build down the fact to burn down the factories happened to be houses with people in them. March 9th. Over 300 B-29s reach Tokyo. They systematically lay down 1,665 tons of M-69 incendiary clusters over the wooden city. It remains the most destructive air raid in the history of mankind. The Japanese later called the early fire raids the Night of the Black Snow because of the debris and the, the impact of, the, of these particular raids on their lives. Master bomber who was watching the raids said you could see the fires 150 miles away. You had asphalt melting in the streets. You had glass melting out of buildings. A lot of the air crews were really shaken up by the results. Tail gunners reported watching people burning to death and burning rivers covered with napalm. Japanese doctors wrote about watching the debris floating in rivers afterwards, and they couldn't tell if it was bodies or sticks of wood. Sixteen square miles are raised to the ground. The inferno claims 90,000 civilian lives and leaves over one million homeless. On the other side of the Atlantic, Allied forces converge to prepare for an equally decisive breakthrough in the liberation of Europe. For the Allies, the D-Day landings represented the success or failure of the entire war. But the outcome really rested on a knife edge. November 1943. Roosevelt, Stalin, and Churchill meet in Tehran to plan Operation Overlord, the invasion of Nazi-occupied Europe. Churchill warns of the challenges that await them. The British had learned firsthand how capable, how effective a fighting force the Wehrmacht was. Britain's experience is chastening. Evacuated from Dunkirk in 1940, driven from Norway and Greece, Yet despite the dangers, the Allies determined to risk everything on a full-scale cross-channel invasion into the teeth of the Nazi defenses. 
In order for D-Day to succeed, it required four distinct events to happen. First, the Allies needed the momentum of manpower and equipment to make it to the beach and continue to reinforce the beachhead once the landings were secure. Secondly was air supremacy. The Allies had to prevent the Germans from reinforcing their positions on the beachhead. Also, the Allies needed a major Soviet offensive so that Germany would be sandwiched between two invading armies. And finally, the element of surprise. If the Germans had been aware that the invasion was coming, it would have certainly failed. To win the intelligence war, the Allies launched Operation Fortitude. Operation Fortitude stands to the present day as arguably the greatest deception plan in modern warfare. In an audacious act of misdirection, a decoy army of 11 ghost divisions figureheaded by General Patton assembles opposite Calais. They had to really trick the German high command into thinking that Calais, the shortest route across the channel, was the way that the invasion was going to be mounted. It had dummy tanks, dummy airstrips, dummy hangars, and they let General Constance Aircraft fly over these areas. They are his a huge army. This is clearly where they're going to put their main effort. With fortitude blinding the Axis, the real invasion force secretly assembles. Nine and a half million tons of supplies, 4,000 amphibious vessels, and over one and a half million troops. The man charged with the immense logistical challenge of the landings is British naval mastermind Sir Bertram Ramsey. Sir Bertram Ramsey's plan was meticulous, it was complex, it was rehearsed, and it was thorough in every way. The plan is astonishing. Almost 7,000 vessels will be loaded with men and supplies and moved in secret to the assembly points. At a predetermined time, they will navigate through narrow channels cleared of mines towards enemy shores through unpredictable seas. Simultaneously, naval screens will be mounted to protect against Axis counterattacks. The scope and depth of it is just off the scale. Me personally, I've been involved in planning for uh, things like uh, Desert Storm, uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom, the early pieces of it, and even that with, with big computers and lots of smart guys working, it was daunting then. Getting the Allied forces to the beachheads is just the start. Awaiting them is Hitler's Atlantic Wall, a defensive network 1,600 miles long and considered by the Fuhrer as unbreachable. It's this combination of everything from millions of mines, specific defenses designed to rip the bottom of a landing craft. Then you get to machine gun bunkers with interlocking fires, six inch cannons, you name it. It's just a nasty, nasty piece of work. You know, there were trained troops that have been there for years, sighting every avenue of approach off the beach. You know there could be massive counterattacks. The Germans are masters at that, so there's just so much uncertainty. The window of opportunity is desperately narrow. Supreme Allied Commander Eisenhower sets the date. June 5th, 1944. Once Eisenhower made the decision, it was irrevocable. There was no plan B. This was it, go for broke. Either the invasion would succeed, or the invasion attempt would have to be put off indefinitely. Dwight Eisenhower sat down and wrote a little note, taking blame for the failure of the landings, that he was prepared to deliver if, if it did fail. No one on the Allied side saw this as a sure thing. As the Allies bombed the French infrastructure connecting Normandy to the east, three million servicemen are locked away from the population. Coastal towns are locked down. The fate of the world hangs in the balance. After an agonizing 24-hour delay due to bad weather, Overlord, the most important Allied operation of World War II 
is set in motion. Before the Armada embarks for Normandy, the Allies launch one final masterclass of deception. To convince the Germans that Calais is the invasion site, British bombers circle at low altitude, dropping tons of metallic chaff into the air. This created a huge radar registry for the Germans and this phantom army that has been constructed in their minds through documents and fake uh, bases. Now it starts to come alive. Totally through the, the German defensive planning, it, it threw it into disarray. With the misdirection campaign underway, the invasion force heads towards its targets. Five beachheads and a clifftop gun emplacement at Point de Hoc. Ahead of the transports, an aerial and naval barrage pounds the coastal defenses. Despite the assault, the men on the landing craft come under ferocious German fire. It was confusing. The German planes were going right over us. There was these bombs and guns were going off and everything else. Some of the boats I got hit by, by bombs already. And all you could see is like, you don't know who they were. See guys laying in the water, some with limbs off and arms. There's more than being frightened on the boats. Some guys were crying a little bit. Some guys was even urinating. We were all nervous. Everybody was. But there's nothing you could do about it. You knew what you had to do and it had to be done. Charles Barley and Michael Vernillo are among the first to hit Omaha, the most heavily defended German position. A lot of guys were in a bunch getting off the boat. And they were killed instantly, you might as well say. When we got into the water, the water was up to my stomach. I said to myself, I said, goodbye, Charlie, you're gone. And that, it was really a terrible feeling in the water. You see those bodies laying around and you couldn't identify them. It was really, really nasty, really bloody. Those fortunate enough to make it off the boats, the scene they would have confronted is almost unimaginable. They would have been suffering still from seasickness. They would have heard the whirring of bullets above their heads. They would have seen in front of them dead and dying American soldiers. But it was more than chaos. It was deadly chaos. As the Allies continue to land against merciless German fire, the casualty rate soars. But after 15 hours of fighting, all beachheads are taken, with Point de Hoc falling the following day. The Allies suffer 10,000 casualties, but it is bloodshed achieving the almost impossible. They have a foothold in Nazi-occupied Europe. For Hitler, this was the nightmare come to pass. We basically, you know, signed the death certificate of Nazi Germany on June 6, 1944. After weeks and weeks of being bottled up in the Normandy beachhead, the breakout that occurred exceeded expectations. The success is down to the network of supply lines chasing the frontline soldiers. Connecting France with the war depot of Britain are artificial mulberry harbors. Landing two and a half million men, four million tons of supplies, and 500,000 vehicles within the first 10 months. Fueling the offensive is Operation Pluto, 70 miles of undersea pipeline pumping up to a million gallons of fuel per day into France. Those tons and those millions of gallons of fuel were on a scale that probably won't be replicated in the future. So what they accomplished uh, might be unique in, a, in, in human history, really. From space, the speed of advance is astounding. August 19th, Paris is liberated, followed by Rouen, Verdun, Antwerp, and Brussels. By September, the Allies reach the Siegfried Line on the cusp of the German fatherland. Hitler launches his final desperate counterattack, the Battle of the Bulge. Despite heavy losses, the Allies prevail, and Nazi Germany stands on the abyss. Hitler's gamble in the Ardennes 
basically ensures the end of the right. This was his last operational force he had where he could try to influence the pace of either front, east or west. Once he threw that force away, the American-Soviet conquering of the Reich in the next year was inevitable. The war in Europe nears its climax. On the other side of the planet, the drive towards Japan is also approaching its bloody conclusion. But every island invaded is coming at increasingly higher cost. At every stage, the ferocity and intensity of the Japanese defense increases. What they thought were suicidal defense tactics in Saipan are redoubled at Iwo Jima. February 19th, 1945. 60,000 U.S. Marines stormed the island of Iwo Jima, where a battle of unrivaled brutality begins. The fighting on Iwo Jima stands as arguably the fiercest fighting that U.S. military personnel have ever experienced. There was no amount of punishment could be inflicted on the Japanese that would cause them to lose their will. Essentially, they've decided that they are going to die there. When you have that kind of suicidal fervor, it means the sort of tactics that you might have used previously don't work. And so we start using flamethrowers, napalm, tanks up close, a style of battle that raises the level of violence even past what we've seen in earlier parts of World War II, which is hard to imagine. When Iwo Jima falls, Japan suffers 20,000 casualties compared to 23,000 American. The first time U.S. casualties exceed that of their enemy. As Allied forces prepare to invade Okinawa, the proposed launch pad for the invasion of Japan, the stakes for both sides are vast. The Japanese defenders of Okinawa knew that they were not going to survive, they could not win. But they hoped that by causing enough casualties, creating enough horror, that it might either make the Americans decide not to invade Japan, or at least maybe get the Japanese a better peace offer of some kind. April 1st, 1945. The American Armada approaches its target. Its scale is unmatched in the Pacific War. Okinawa was a military undertaking on a scale that rivaled D-Day. Uh, the, the size of the invasion force, the size of the invasion fleet, 1,200 warships support three mass amphibious attack forces hitting the beaches. More than 170,000 troops land eerily unopposed. But unseen by American troops are 97,000 Japanese defenders, ready to strike with unprecedented savagery. They are taking the Japanese soldier and using just his body as a weapon. Japanese soldiers with 22-pound satchel bombs run under tanks. 6,000 defenders bonsai charge Marines armed only with bamboo spears and sidearms. In our own time, we make the comparison with suicide bombers, but if you can imagine where entire Japanese units have that depth of commitment, that they would actually suffer mass essentially suicidal death rather than surrender their position. That's a very formidable military obstacle. At sea, wave after wave of kamikazes crash into U.S. ships. The kamikazes were especially terrifying to the Americans trying to shoot them down because how do you deter somebody who's willing to die for something? Their goal was to die, and 18% of the kamikazes hit ships. 404 U.S. ships are struck. When Okinawa finally falls, nearly 100,000 Japanese soldiers and 150,000 civilians lie dead. The U.S. suffers 76,000 casualties, a third of the entire invasion force. The escalation is, is horrifying here. And these are little islands. And now we're talking about invading the whole Japanese homeland where there are millions of defenders and even more millions of civilians. 
The U.S. War Department estimates that the invasion of Japan will result in 10 million Japanese casualties, along with at least 1.7 million American. Another solution must be sought. As the Allies celebrate victory in Europe, as Hitler and his Reich go up in flames, America swears in a new president. And Harry Truman is destined to unleash a weapon so fearsome it will herald in a new dawn of warfare across the globe. War has ravaged the world for nearly six years. Germany and Italy are defeated. Only Japan fights on in defiance of the Allies. But a new weapon is about to make World War II reach its climax. December 1938, German scientists split the atom, releasing 200 million volts of electricity. After Albert Einstein warns U.S. President Roosevelt that Hitler plans an atomic program, the race for the bomb is on. America, in collaboration with Britain and Canada, launches the Manhattan Project. Entire towns and industrial complexes are constructed across the nation. Employing 600,000 people and costing $2 billion, $25.8 billion in today's money, it is engineering on an unprecedented scale. No other nation in the world could have done the Manhattan Project like the United States did. You get all these theorists together and they say there are two ways we can build this weapon. There's a plutonium bomb and a uranium bomb. They're different processes. They're both immensely expensive. Anybody else would have said, which one do I want to focus on? And the U.S. said, we want to make sure this works. We're going to do both. July 1945. The project bears fruit. A uranium bomb, codenamed Little Boy, and a plutonium bomb, codenamed Fat Man. The atomic bomb is a technology that historically is on the scale of the introduction of gunpowder. They've taken the kind of lethality that's been honed throughout World War II and multiplied it by a whole new order of magnitude. For the first time, with a single event, an entire city could be destroyed. This represented a new era in warfare. Returning from the Potsdam Conference, U.S. President Harry S. Truman must decide whether to unleash the atomic bomb on Japan. If it had come out a year later that the President of the United States had a weapon he could have used, it might have ended the war earlier, and instead he did not, and we suffered 100,000 extra casualties, he would have been run out of, at best, run out of town on a rail. There was no way an American president responsible to his constituents could have not used this weapon. Truman, hostile to Stalin and his communist ethos, can see the significance of a nuclear strike for the post-war world. In 1945, America faced a real paradox. For a long time, of course, Roosevelt and Truman had been saying to Stalin, you know, please help us with the war against Japan, please invade Manchuria, please defeat the Japanese army. But when it was realized that the Soviet Union might defeat the Japanese and then move on and occupy part of the Japanese islands, uh, that's not what the Americans wanted at all. They wanted the task of rebuilding Japan. I think this was one of the most important factors in influencing the American decision to drop the atomic bomb. After a successful test in the New Mexico desert, Truman gives the order to drop the bomb as soon as possible. A number of cities were chosen as potential targets. They were left untouched by the incendiary bombing because if you bombed a city, you couldn't tell how much damage had been done by the atomic attacks. They were also looking for one with quite a large population because if you could attack a city with a large population, you again would be able to see the full impact. When you look at it, this is a really cynical decision for choosing a, a, a target on which you're going to drop the most dangerous weapon that's ever been developed. On August 6, 1945, the Enola Gay launches from the Mariana Islands. At 8.15 local time, 
Little Boy, loaded with 60 kilograms of uranium, is released over Hiroshima. 43 seconds later, the world changes forever. The blast creates a circle of devastation one mile wide with fires over another four and a half mile radius. 60,000 are killed instantly with a further 100,000 dying from burns and radiation. Three days later, Fat Man is exploded over Nagasaki, killing 80,000 civilians. After the first bomb in Japan, there was a certain amount of disbelief. After Nagasaki, though, it's kind of hard to deny that Americans had some kind of new weapon here. And this is just the start of what can be a long pattern of destruction. September 2nd, 1945, Japan capitulates. World War II is over. The nuclear age has begun. A lot of people think that the moral ethical line of destruction in World War II is crossing the atomic bomb. I disagree. I think that if there's any moral lines left, they're all crossed with the fire raids against Japanese cities. The whole question of the atomic bomb is, will we continue to do what our weapons make possible? And that is the ultimate dilemma we've hit with atomic and, and, and nuclear weapons. You ask who won World War II, and if by that you mean what society, what nation contributed the most blood and treasure to the eventual victory, it's not the United States, it's the Soviet Union. Soviet losses in the war are over 25 million people. Uh, American losses are 405,399 military dead and a handful of civilians. But if you ask the question who won World War II, and you mean who ended up in the most advantageous position at the end of the war, reap the greatest fruits of victory, then the answer is clearly the United States. During the six years of war, America grows from the 17th world military power to number one. Her overseas bases expand from 14 to over 30,000 spread across the globe. Her GNP doubles and she becomes the biggest creditor in the world, commanding half of the planet's manufacturing capacity and owning two-thirds of the world's gold stocks. It dominates the world economy. It controls the formation of the UN. It launches the world on a path towards globalization that it wants. But it can no longer go back to being an isolationist. The isolation of America is gone forever. I'm not sure if it is actually sunk in even today how much we have to be involved. But as a result of World War II, we're drowning in the world's ways we cannot escape whether we realize it or not.